You can hear me, right? Yeah, so that, that, that should be fine for now. I was just confused. <laughs> well, great. Uh, well, welcome to today's class. Um, I'm excited for uh, our lesson on containment. And uh, let's see. Christina, would you offer our prayer for us, please? Sure. Thanks so much. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this class and for the opportunity to learn in this life. And we ask that that would help us um, understand Ladies what truth opinion. is and where we can find it in this world and that we can understand thy will for us. And um, ask that thy spirit may be with us in this class. And we say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Well, thanks so much. Okay. And let's see. Um, welcome, Wendy. Uh, Wendy, can you hear us? Hello, Wendy. Okay. Well. Okay. Great. Well, so we'll talk about containment today. This is an introduction to the West's foreign policy from 1946 to 1949. Uh, we spent. We spent yesterday talking um, about Stalin uh, in the East, and then we spent the day before that talking about Lenin in the East. And so now we're going to swing to the West and uh, look at the Cold War there. So first of all, from what you know about the Cold War, including your reading for today, describe the West's policy of containment, which had military, economic, and diplomatic ramifications in the West's dealings with the East. What was it? What was it not? Just so you know, I didn't get my reading done, so I'm going to do a lot of listening today. Okay, that's okay. I'm sure there'll be plenty of things that you can still reason and relate with us, though. So don't 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 be uh, don't be shy with that. Uh, but that's okay uh, about the about the reading. Um, any ideas? Containment, at least, uh, if you didn't do the reading, what does it sound like? What does it look like? What word do you see within containment that could help you understand its meaning and what that might mean for the Cold War? What would you reason? I think I would reason um, containing. Um, I also wasn't able to do the readings because it wasn't working on our computer for some reasons this morning. But um, um, I would understand containing uh, communism in where it is to stop it from spreading instead of trying to perhaps obliterate it from everywhere, just keeping it where it is and not letting it spread. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. And so if, that, if that's, um, that's what it is, then what would it not be, would you guess? And if you think about other alternatives or other, other options, uh, if you are um, the United States, or if you're Great Britain and you're thinking about what to do regarding um, the spread of communism in the world. Can you think of anything that it would not be? Well, it doesn't sound very passive, like just letting it spread or not spread, but actually getting involved. So it wouldn't be just sitting there and letting it, you know, spread. Yeah, definitely. Well, let's, let's take a look here. Um, at three different options right, that we can compare and contrast. Uh, these are options, main options, right, for what's called grand strategy in the West. And if we try to understand um, these three different strategies, uh, we can think to ourselves um, and reason, which option dominated U.S. Cold War strategy? Let's see. Hello, Wendy. Christina has left. Um, Heidi, can you still hear me? I can still hear you, but yeah, that was weird. Okay, so Christina, okay, so, um, I can tell that Wendy still, she still can't hear, or, because I can always tell when she logs on, because it gets really staticky. And she said I still can't hear. I'll try one more time. Um, hmm. I don't know what happened to Christina. Uh, yeah. She's maybe plug and unplug. You know, um, what else? What else have we done in the past? We tried the logging in, the logging off. 
Um. Hmm. Um. Hmm. See, hello, Christina. Christina. Hello, Christina. Um, Christina, can you hear us? Yeah, sorry, Hello? I can hear you. Okay, what, what, what happened? Sorry, no, I, I was trying to fix the problem and, and basically got kicked out, so. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Okay, uh, Wendy? Hi, I can Hello, hear you Wendy. now. Can you okay. hear me? What? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, what, what happened? Well, I was just about well, to log off. I was just about to log off for the third time and use the phone to call in, but a little pop-up came out on my screen that said, do you want to try some new audio software? And I said, yes, and it worked. I don't <laughs> know what it was. Okay. Okay. Well, we're glad you're here. Yeah, um, not quite not quite sure why why things happen the way they happen. But at least we're all here now. Okay, let's go all we can then. So here we have three main options for grand strategy in the West during the Cold War. Appeasement, containment, and rollback. So let's just, uh, if we look at these different examples here, uh, as, as, as different options that, that the US and, and other nations uh, could have chosen, uh, and we look at these examples, what would they be? Um, how would you compare and contrast these three different options? Any ideas about the similarities or differences? Okay, well, it looks like containment is trying to keep communism within that country or even getting rid of it, because isn't that what they tried to do with the, with, the America, with the Korean and the Vietnam War? Well, if we look at Korea, right, we have Korea uh, in 1945 divided into two occupation zones. The occupation zone in the north uh, was occupied um, and influenced by the Soviets, the one in the south uh, by the United States. Um, at about the 38th parallel. Um, and so in uh, 1948, we see once those two states can't agree on reunification of, of Korea, the Korean Peninsula, uh, they create a separate North Korea and then a separate South Korea. Well, a couple years later, 1950, we see the North, right, um, inspired by the Soviets, helped out uh, by Chinese communists, um, attack and invade um, South Korea. And so we see the North trying to take more land, or the communists trying to expand into um, democratic capitalist South Korea. So that's, that's Korea. Now, let me just give you an example here with, um, with Grenada. Grenada in 1983, under Reagan, uh, we see um, there had been a, a Marxist regime that had taken power. Uh, they were in control. Uh, and then the United States, uh, after that group had taken control, um, went in and then overturned that government and replaced it uh, with with the pro-West government. So w what do you see in terms of any differences there? Uh, Cuba, 1961, that was um, the Bay of Pigs, uh, where the U.S. tried to overturn Castro uh, in a place that had been communist. Uh, they failed. So what would we say? So a rollback is trying to get rid of it altogether, where containment is just trying to keep it from spreading. Right. Yeah. Definitely. So containment, you know, if, if you have if you have a peninsula like the Korean Peninsula, and you have the North that's communist and the South um, that is uh, pro-West, right? Well, you want to keep that line there. If this if the North Korea attacks, right, then under containment, you then would defend and then um, try to keep the communist nation from gaining ground. Uh, but with rollback, you go into a nation that is already communist and try to turn it into one uh, that would be friendly to the West. And so there we have this different now appeasement, right? That, that's the policy that we saw uh, before um, World War II, in which Britain and France allowed uh, German aggression in the Sudetenland and Czechoslovakia, um, Austria, um, between 1937 and 1939. Um, so, if we look at these three, right, what would we say about them then? 
as, as different options for the Cold War strategist uh, in the West. Well, I would say that the U.S. primarily relied on containment and a little bit of rollback, not much appeasement at all. Yeah, definitely, right? And, and so if, if, we try to, if we try to think about these sort of three options, right, uh, the U.S. would very firmly, right, for most of the 40 years um, be, um, oh, I don't know, maybe 80% in containment and then maybe almost 10% in rollback. Uh, and so if we, if we look at this, then this will sort of set the tone for today. Um, just interesting, and we just try to understand uh, these topics of, you know, containment or rollback. Uh, today we'll mostly focus on containment because that's what um, the Truman administration chose as the policy for uh, the United States, which would become the policy for the next 40 years uh, regarding um, the Soviets. Um, some interesting quotes um, from Pe President Benson that give us some things to think about here. Of course, uh, we've looked at, you know, We've talked about this quote before, that today we are in a battle for the bodies and souls of man. It is a battle between two opposing systems, right? Freedom and slavery, Christ and Antichrist. Um, talks about how God must have a free people to prosper his work and bring about Zion. Um, and then he talks about how, uh, as he watched that great iron curtain drop around nations which formerly had prized their freedom, good people, I was aghast as these were written off by the stroke of a pen. I saw Poland abandoned with a heritage of freedom, excuse me, abandoned by nations with a heritage of freedom, the United States and Great Britain. He talks about uh, different instances in his life where he also witnessed the spread of communism and his thoughts about it. He said, I was in Warsaw in June of 1946. I shared a room with seven other men in the Polonia Hotel, the only hotel even partially intact in the great city of Warsaw. Our ambassador, Bliss Lane, had his office in part of the building. He was so saddened that he resigned and wrote the book, I Saw Poland Betrayed which detailed the failure of the United States and England to keep their promise that the Poles would have a free election after the war. I saw firsthand our great nation stand by at the time of the Hungarian Revolution when freedom fighters with bare hands and stones resisted bullets, tanks, and artillery. I confess I was ashamed at the response of my country, a nation which I believe the Lord intended to be an ensign of freedom to all others. Freedom did not die that day, 23 October 1956, for Hungary alone. Hope died for many in other captive nations and has only recently been somewhat revived by courageous men willing to speak against oppression. Uh, he goes on and talks about how uh, in, in our country, now stepping aside from foreign affairs, in our country we have to a great extent accommodated ourselves to communism. We have permitted ourselves to become encircled by its tentacles, though we give lip service to the Monroe Doctrine, right? and that would be that um, an attack in the um, Western, Western Hemisphere uh, North America um, would would be um, inappropriate, would be grounds uh, for defense. Right? This has not prevented Cuba from becoming a Soviet military base 90 miles off our coastline, nor has it prevented the takeover of Nicaragua and Central America, the surrender of the Panama Canal, or the infiltration by enemy agents within our American borders. Never before has the land of Zion appeared so vulnerable to so powerful an enemy as the Americas do at present, and our vulnerability is directly attributable to our loss of an active faith in the God of this land, who has decreed that we must worship him or be swept off. Too many Americans have lost sight of the truth that God is the source of our freedom, the lawgiver, and that personal righteousness is the most important essential to preserving our freedom. Uh, talks about how um, that once freedom is lost, only blood, human blood, will win it back. Uh, and then, um, the closing quote from this, a witness and a warning, um, General Conference of 79, October, we must awaken to a sense of our awful situation because of this secret combination which is among us. We must not tolerate accommodation with or appeasement toward the false system of communism. We must demand of our elected officials that we not only resist communism, but that we will take every measure to prevent its intrusion into this hemisphere. It is vital that we invoke the Monroe Doctrine. Then we must put our trust in him who has promised us his protection and pray that he will intervene to preserve our freedom just as he intervened in our obtaining it in the first place. Okay, so with that said then, what would, how would we relate that to those, um, those three different doctrines uh, that the U.S. had to choose from, those main, main ideas about how to um, live during the Cold War? Well, I would say that President Benson definitely wanted us to 
have a rollback, at least as far as the United States was concerned. He doesn't want us to allow it at all. Okay. So, so, so and, and, and by that, Heidi, are you saying that, that um, if it had seeped into the United States that it should be kicked out? Is that, is that what you're saying by yeah. with, with mm -hmm. use of rollback? Okay. Uh-huh. Yeah. But I have what to admit that I'm a little bit confused about, it almost seems a little um, controversial because I thought that we were supposed to kind of be an isolationist country, but he's sort of saying that we didn't do our job in helping out Poland and, what, Hungary? Mm-hmm. So yeah, what, what would we, what would we say? I'm kind of perplexed about that. One thing that struck me by his quote is, is his mention of communism being a secret combination. And I guess before this class I didn't really quite um, think about it using that term from the Book of Mormon. You know, we think about the secret combinations in the Book of Mormon and I always just think of, you know, some terrible things that don't really exist today, but of course they do and this is one of the forms in which it exists. And um, it just seems like he is saying that we need to fight against this as a secret combination where it becomes a very spiritual matter rather than just a political one. I guess that's how it struck me that um, I suppose he'd say, you would say that if communism wasn't in the United States he was calling for containment to keep it out of our hemisphere as he said it. Um, but, but anyway, that, that was just a thought I had about his use of, uh, of uh, secret combinations. Yeah, thanks so much for that. Um, Wendy, any thoughts? Well, um, back to Heidi's comment, I'm, I, um, I always feel like when, um, especially like when I was reading these speeches from today's reading, that they're talking about sending money over to these, these other countries to prevent the spread of communism. Um, and to help them out um, with food and with and with soldiers, I my personal feeling is that th that is something we should do, um, mm -hmm. but I don't. But I don't think they should. We sh I think it should be voluntary. I think pe good good Christians ought to rise up and do that voluntarily. I don't think it it should be um, a, a mandatory taxpayer funded situation. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah, so, so I mean, if, as, we, as we look at, at the Cold War, right, and, and we really see the spreading over the earth of, of godless communism, uh, the phrase that President Benson talks about all the time, uh, you know, the spreading of atheism, the spreading um, of the socialism and communism, um, the spreading of totalitarianism, the spreading um, of force, the spreading of a loss of uh, individual freedoms, rights, uh, you know, natural liberties, that sort of thing. Um, as we as we as we think about that, right? Um, what do we think about the policy of containment, or what do we think about the policy of rollback? Were those were those good policies? Were they bad policies? Were they somewhere in between? Uh, what would you say? I mean, if you if you if you saw communism spreading, um, how would you have reacted to it in in light of these these quotes and and, and uh, your your personal feelings? Well, can I just ask for a clarification? Because yeah. what I hear of the Cold War, and maybe you talked about this yesterday, I'm sorry I wasn't able to be at class, but That's okay. I, I always thought the Cold War meant nuclear arms. But as we sure, well, that, that would be a big part of it. And, and in fact, we'll talk a little bit today about how, how uh, nuclear weapons between, became uh, the centerpiece of military defense during the years of the Cold War for the U.S. and the USSR. And so we had this huge stockpiling of, of weapons, the arms race, the race to build bigger and, and badder, um, more effective, so to speak, um, nuclear weapons uh, and other weapons uh, and um, strategic uh, defense initiatives uh, using satellites and other types of surveillance, uh, airplanes, as well as um, different types of missiles and you know, long-range um, long uh, weapons capable of, of you know, mass destruction over uh, long, long, uh, long uh, areas of of the uh, of the world. So if we think about that, right? We think about um, the Cold War. The Cold War 
um, really is a battle between two competing ideologies or two competing ways of life. Um, we see the term sphere of influence, and we see these two great spheres of influence um, really taking over the world. And uh, I have some maps to show you, and we'll talk about what the Iron Curtain meant, and we'll talk about the bipolar world. Uh, and of course, there were countries that were not aligned. There were countries that chose to stay out of things. Um, but really, so much of the world uh, was either uh, in the communist camp or in the, the Western um, camp. And so, and so we started to see that because of this, um, both sides want to expand. Right? Both sides hope that their doctrines and principles will be the ones that will rule the 20th century and, and beyond. Uh, and so as a result of that, we have different conflicts that become hot wars, meaning shooting wars, right? during this Cold War or um, this uh, philosophical standoff that had nuclear arms behind it right? with buttons that were ready to be pushed at, at any moment um, if uh, a wrong step was made. Does that answer your question? So basically the Cold War is more about the spread of communism and the whole weapons part is just a little sub-containment of that? I mean, well, it's just a piece I mean, of it? really, the weapons part of it backed it up, um, but also it, it wasn't just the spread of communism, it was also right, the proposed and the hoped for expansion um, of principles of Republican and Democratic um, constitutional um, capitalist um, societies based on freedoms and on Christianity. And so really we see two, two competing superpowers, right, vying for the nations of the earth. So where does it get its name Cold War? Right, so it was a Cold War um, because it lasted from 1945 to 1991, and it wasn't a war that was hot or a shooting war all the time. It was a war that always had the threat or the potential of becoming a shooting war, and in many instances and in many countries uh, became a shooting war, but it was really one in which you had these two great superpowers calling for converts, competing uh, to bring people onto their side to promote you know, their way of life, the things that they, the principles they held dear and that they thought were, were right for the earth or that they thought were best for workers or you know, for whoever. Um, and so because of that, right, it's this cold war because it was always a war that had the possibility um, of becoming World War III. But yet, a lot of the time it was cold, even while it was hot in certain areas. But it wasn't hot for the whole world all the time. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So it was really just the competition of the two ideas, kind of the East versus yeah. the West? Yeah. Mm -hmm. East versus West, 1945 to 1991. Well, and did people see the West as, was Christianity part of that? Sure. Well, I mean, it, and certainly it's, it's something that at least uh, politicians would talk about. Uh, you know, Churchill talks about the spread of Christian civilization, defending Christian civilization. Uh, Truman uh, was himself a Christian uh, and believed in, in spreading Christian freedoms throughout the world. Uh, and so certainly, you know, it, this wasn't, you know, this wasn't two churches going at it, right? But really, we do see two ways of life. And, you know, in the 1940s, 1950s, uh, we did see Christianity and, and protecting the Christian way of life and Christian civilization uh, as, as strong as it, as it was at that time um, as a central issue. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's a so great question. So you have to be so basic, Christine and Wendy. <laughs> I always yeah. thought it was any, just any other thoughts about arms, containment yeah, versus so. rollback before we look at how it all well, shook down. Without fully knowing yet um, how the policy of containment was carried out, I can see how it could be a very important policy. Um, what came to my mind, and it's not a perfect analogy, but it's just something that kind of helped me. Is you know, I've, I'm sure you've all heard of the the analogy of somebody being bitten by a snake and then they spend so much time trying to kill a snake that they die of the poison instead of trying to take care of the spread of the poison. So I could see how it could be very important to stop the spread of the poison in this example being communism before you know trying to get the source out. So I could see that as a very important policy is what I'm saying instead of just focusing on rollback which I think if, if you had just did that then it could still be spreading while you're still beating at the source. So I, I guess I could just, I'm just saying that I think I could see the use of containment, but I 
at this point I don't know how it was carried out and if it was carried out in a good way or a bad way. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and certainly this is an issue that uh, you know it uh, it was it was controversial then and it's controversial now. There are you know many sides to it. We have uh, some people saying that you know the United States um, should only get involved in military affairs if there is a direct uh, attack on its territory. Uh, you have other people saying that you know the Cold War is a little different because we're talking about um, a way of life that's spreading over the earth um, that could destroy um, you know the the basic tenets um, of Christian civilization, uh, and so that uh, when these other countries fell as power was gained by um, the communists, uh, more and more power as as they expanded, uh, that it, it was in fact uh, you know a, an, a, an attack a direct attack on uh, the Christian, the, the way of life in the West, and so it needed to be stood up for. Uh, and, and so really, you know, it, it's interesting. Lots of people you know, took, took different sides, some of them preferring isolationism, some of them, some of them wanted to go in and, and take, take out all of the countries that were already communist and turn them into uh, capitalist, democratic republics. Um, others said, well, you know, hey, they, let's, let's at least um, stop it where it's at. Um, and not let it to spread any further. So really, you know, the opinions went um, back and forth. Um, but certainly, this is, is uh, a different nature than just, uh, you know, one nation being aggressive against another. Um, and so that's why even, even some isolationists um, really thought a lot uh, about the Cold War um, and, and trying to understand, you know, is containment um, permissible or is it not, um, just because of the nature of the war. Um, and, you know, is it getting into an entangling alliance? to try to prevent the spread of communism there, um, or is that actually um, important to this different case than something that would just be so sort of like, like World War I, you know, sticking our nose in someone else's business or helping somebody else out. So, you know, the Cold War is, is very unique, uh, and so it gives us a lot, a lot to think about. Well, following World War II, tensions mounted between the respective U.S. and USSR-led military alliances. Uh, the former standing for democratic capitalism and its institutions based on Christian freedom, uh, and the latter for totalitarian and communism and its institution based on godless force. Uh, the U.S. chose containment, the policy of containing communism within its present boundaries, as its primary strategy for international policy, which avoided nuclear holocaust and checked communism spread in many parts of the world, but led the U.S. into two major wars, Korea and Vietnam, and countless smaller conflicts. And so really the U.S. saw this as more of a middle ground, uh, an aggressive middle ground, uh, but certainly not rollback, like I said, which was going in and just invading communist countries to turn them back over uh, to the ideals of the West. So uh, as, as sort of a middle-of-the-road policy, um, the U.S. would stick with it for 40 years. Truman held a deep distrust for the Soviet Union and a personal loathing of Joseph Stalin. He was bitterly disappointed in the outcomes of the Yalta Conference and Potsdam Conference. Uh, both were in 1945. Uh, they confirmed Stalin's commitment to a communist post-war Poland, a divided post-war Germany, and communism in eastern Germany, and generally non-democratic pro-Soviet elements throughout post-war Europe. Um, and he was irate at Stalin's systematic establishment of communist governments in the nations of Central and Eastern Europe. And so Stalin was being aggressive. Um, and if the United States or the Allies you know, weren't going to stop him, he was happy to go and take um, as, much, as much ground as he could for communism. By 1946, Truman's hope of a unified, open, democratic, and capitalist post-war world based on the principles of self-determination, economic and political freedom and cooperation, and disarmament, right? And these are the ideals set forth in the Atlantic Charter of 1941 between FDR and then Churchill, right? They had vanished. Um, this hope had vanished. Instead, Truman believed that the U.S. needed to lead its allies in the West in containing further Soviet expansion. And from 1946 through 1949, the bipolar world of two competing international blocs began to crystallize. In 1946, in between terms as Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, the first was 40 to 45, and then he actually lost an election, um, and then was re-elected uh, 51 to 55. Winston Churchill made a trip to the United States and delivered a speech at Westminster College in Missouri that famously articulated the rationale behind the West's foreign policy. At the time of his speech, the Soviet Union had created satellite nations, communist, pro-Soviet allies throughout Eastern Europe, and were supporting communist movements in China, Iran, Turkey, Greece, and Northern Korea. Uh, once again, if we take a look here, and we see right now this, uh, this map 
um, can show you the influence uh, of the, the Soviet Union as it had spread uh, into Eastern Europe. Uh, we can see this, this iron curtain here that has fallen at the, the edge of the red. Uh, we can see the blue, uh, which would be the, uh, the west. And so we have east versus west facing off um, in these alliances, uh, which would become formal military alliances a little bit later on. And so if we look at Churchill's speech, what does Churchill say about America's role in the world? What would you reason? Well, he was kind of saying, since you are the, the main power of the world, you have a pretty big responsibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's saying, you know, as, as, as America goes, so goes the West and Christian civilization, democratic civilization, civilization based on freedom, etc. He really, he put um, the onus of responsibility on the shoulders of the United States, uh, being the greatest superpower in the world at the time. Well, now what about the Iron Curtain, right? Explain Churchill's Iron Curtain as it relates to spheres of influence. What did he say? That it had descended across the European continent and that all those within the Soviet sphere were not only subject to Soviet influence, but even control. Right, yeah, control from Moscow, that they um, had, they, in this iron, once again, it's an iron curtain, it's not just, you know, the dark curtain or the, the communist curtain, it's an iron curtain because he was advocating, right, just as, as Wendy was saying, right, that they were under the control, they were prisoners, right, of the Soviets, of the communists, and so they would be used as tools, right, in the Soviets' hands, in Stalin's hands at this time, uh, and so there was this, this great fear of uh, what the world would be like. Um, as the Iron Curtain uh, either expanded um, or, or did what it would do throughout the world. So if we, if we look at the Cold War then, and this, this, this will go back to Heidi's great question uh, about the Cold War, right? We look at this quote below, right? How does, how does Churchill um, talk about the Cold War, right? Explain the Cold War from his quote. What is it? That they intend to, that communists intend to expand, and that this right. is our chance to stop that. Right. You know, he says, uh, "I don't believe the Soviet that Soviet Russia desires a war. What they desire is the fruits of war and the indefinite expansion of their power and doctrines." Right. He says that this expansion uh, is a challenge and peril to Christian civilization, uh, and so he says, right, that. Um, what we have to consider today, while time remains, is the permanent prevention of war and the establishment of conditions of freedom and democracy as rapidly as possible in all countries. So we see, right, these two competing spheres of influence, right? They're both trying to promote their principles, their ideals about how the world should work, their ways of life. Well, um, certainly I think it's interesting if you were to, and we won't spend too much time on this, but uh, just imagine what life would have been like if you had lived behind the Iron Curtain, if you had converted to the gospel, uh, and then the curtain fell, and you couldn't get out, and you were within the grasp uh, of uh, the Soviet Union under, under control uh, in many instances. Right? I, I love uh, what Elder Hale says here. What does he say that, that those saints behind the Iron Curtain, what, what do they need to cling to, and what, what lesson does this teach us? He talks about seeking the voice of the Lord through the scriptures, which... I think teaches me that no matter where we're contained um, or trapped in our lives, we can always turn to the scriptures, we can always turn to prayer, and we can hear the voice of the Lord because it can penetrate any, any place in our life or anywhere we might be. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's a wonderful message because certainly, uh, you know, there, there is a spiritual cold war, if you will, going on that we'll talk about a little bit later between the forces of God and the forces of, of darkness. Um, and you know, we have refuge in the scriptures, no matter where we live uh, or what we're doing. Um, certainly, we've probably heard a lot about President Uchtdorf here when he was Elder Uchtdorf. He talked about the power of personal testimony. He talked about the difference of life in East and West Germany because he lived in both, right? I thought it was very interesting, right? What are some of the differences? And, and this helps us to understand the spheres of influence, right? What does this tell you about spheres of influence? How would you relate it? 
look at east versus west. Wow. <laughs> they both, they're both trying to impose their values upon him, whether he was being forced to learn Russian or forced to learn English. Hello? I can hear you, Wendy. Oh, I now I can hear, hear you. Too. Wow, what is going on today? Well, I think it's I think it's a new update of the software, but I don't think it's working very well. <laughs> yeah, we've lost him. Christine and Wendy, are you still there? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Has he written a message? I can't see my messages at all. No. No, he hasn't. Change the page. Oh, Zad. Is he talking? Oh. Thinking we can hear him? Now we now we change the page. He, did, he was cutting out a little bit. Was that happening to you guys, too? Yeah, I, I was having problems hearing him all day. Shall we just take turns reading these three bullet points until he gets back? I'll start with the first one. In 1946, Stalin tried to take from Turkey control of the sea lanes, the Bosphorus and Dardanelles Straits, from the Black Sea to the Mediterranean, and in Greece, communist forces threatened the pro-West government in Athens. In February 1946, U.S. diplomat George F. Kennan wrote his long telegram from Moscow, which asserted that the USSR was impervious to logic of reason, but highly sensitive to logic of force. For this reason, it can easily withdraw, and usually does, when strong resistance is encountered at any point. In January 1947, Kennan wrote, The sources of Soviet conduct, which famously advocated that in these circumstances, it is clear that the main element of any United States policy toward the Soviet Union must be that of long-term, patient but firm, and vigilant containment of Russian expansive tendencies. So, Wendy, I'm curious to know how you feel about all of this because it seems to me like, I mean, what these things are saying and what President Benson was saying was that we do need to go in and do something about this. That kind of goes against the entangling alliances, isolationist kind of, you know, point of view. So what would you say to all of this? Yeah, I I understand. I I just feel like those are those are good and right things to do and and they just need to be done voluntarily. I just I Hello? Are you there? Oh, oh there great. he is. Oh, Hello? Hello? Now I can hear you. Hello, can, you, can you hear me? You now. Yeah, we can now. Okay. What, did anybody know what happened? <laughs> no, I, no idea, but we, we read these three different bullet points while you were gone. Oh, okay. Uh, okay, well, yeah, so canon becomes very important. There we go. March of 1947, Truman drew upon the ideas of Kennan to formally announce what would become the foremost Cold War strategy of the U.S. for the next 40 years. Right? And so as we're looking at the Truman Doctrine, really, uh, it's grounded in the, in the uh, foreign policy philosophies of George F. Kennan. Um, the Marshall Plan, which we've talked about in a previous class, 47 to 51, otherwise known as the European Recovery Program, would be an economic manifestation to the tune of almost $13 billion um, of the doctrine. So here's the Truman Doctrine, 1947. So uh, if you've read Truman, right, why does Greece need help? What does Truman say? Well, I, just for the obvious reasons, and, and I can't help but, as I read that about Greece and Turkey, thinking, well, what other um, 
what other 25 countries would have been in the same boat? Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, definitely. And, and certainly it is interesting, right, that, that the flashpoints um, are in Greece and Turkey rather than, like you said, one of these other 25 potential countries. Definitely. And so we have this little, 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 little Greece unable to defend itself. It's weak. It's coming under communist control. Um, and the U.S. is saying, wait a minute, we're going to start this policy of containment. Greece had been, right, Republican, Democratic, right? Sure, there have been some corruption. As Truman says, you know, we don't agree with everything the Greek, the Greek government, uh, the Greek government has ever done. <clears throat> but, um, you know, we don't want it to fall to communism. It had been um, pro-West. And so, um, why must the U.S., though, be the, the ones to provide assistance to Greece? Why not, I don't know, Britain? What does Truman say about that? He said they were having problems themselves, and the United Nations couldn't help either. The U.S., obviously, being separated by oceans, hadn't been as affected by the war. And back to the other question, so you're saying they, they specifically targeted Greece and Turkey because they were boundary countries that would, would have succumbed first to communism. Is that right? right? Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. But I, I yeah, can just definitely. see how this, this, this logic just opens the door towards, I mean, we, we see where it's taken us 50 years later. You know, now, now we're supposed to help everyone who needs help. Right. Um, it, you know, it just, it, it isn't very much of a twist of logic before, before you've got what we've got today. Yeah, definitely, right? And that's, that's the thing. Talk, talk about a slippery slope. Right? I mean, this, this truly right, is right. a slippery slope. Definitely. Well, um, if we look at the objectives, right, of uh, foreign policy of the U.S., it's interesting, right? How does Truman explain the objectives of U.S. foreign policy? Well, they all, every, every reading we did today mentions the United Nations at least three times of peace. And, and so, mm -hmm. and, and they're basically just quoting from that charter that we're, we're going to um, allow for, you know, trying to create peace in the world, basically. Well, sure, yeah, trying to create pre peace and then promoting the ideals, right, of that UN charter. Uh, right, which he would say, right, would be, you know, conditions in which we and other nations will be able to work out a way of life free from coercion, uh, you know, talks about, um, you know, basically taking out totalitarian regimes that are imposed on free peoples um, because they under undermine international peace and the security of the United States, right? Um, okay, well, if we, if we then Can look, I ask a right, quick question? Oh, go ahead, please. When, when did Russia join the, the United Nations? Was it after 89 at some point? I mean, I, I, my, I guess my bigger question is, when did, the, when did communist nations start joining the United Nations? Yeah, well, well, actually, Russia was one of the original security members of the United Nations. Oh, yeah, that's right, duh. So, so, so they, were, they were already part of it. How were they doing that with a straight face? <laughs> Yeah, no, there, there, uh, there are many, many, um, many times they just didn't participate in in the UN program, even though even though they're one of the founding members. But everyone was well aware of the fact that they they were doing the opposite of what the United Nations had supposedly set out to accomplish. That was that really obvious yeah. to everyone? Oh yeah, no, it was obvious to everyone. Um, and when, when the USSR chose to participate, uh, you know, it would still talk about, hey, you know, we want peace in the world, too, but we want it, we want it under our way of life. Um, and, you know, just let us do our thing, and, you know, you'll be fine. Uh, and, and so, so really, basically, we just needed this tension, this tension that, go ahead. So they, they remained a member of the United Nations in good standing from World War II all the way up till now. Is that correct? Uh, I don't know if I would say good standing. I think that might be a stretch. <laughs> but there were definitely communist nations that were members of the UN all the way through. Okay, but I just, I just, ne I mean, they were never kicked out of the United Nations for failing to um, promote its its so supposed goals. Right. J just because the Cold War, I mean, arguably, stayed mostly cold. You know, despite 
things like Korea and Vietnam that lasted for years. But um, in international diplomacy, um, because there wasn't a World War III, right, people still felt that they could talk to each other and still try to talk things out. And so the UN still, um, in many cases, stayed as it was. Even though, interestingly enough, uh, communist China, and we'll talk about Mao uh, next week, uh, communist China replaced um, Chiang Kai-shek's China. Um, and actually, was, and Chiang Kai-shek's China, which was the non-communist China, was actually booted out of the United Nations. Okay, because so I remember, we actually see you know, the United just Nations a few years ago. More communist, um, as, as now China replaced Chiang Kai-shek's. And China was kicked out of the United Nations when? So, so this is so in 19, 1949, right? We see uh, the United, we see um, Mao, Mao's China taking control, uh, and we see Chiang Kai-shek fleeing to Taiwan. After that point, we see the United Nations recognizing as the delegation from China the communist delegation, um, which took the place of Chiang Kai-shek's China. Oh, gosh. Okay, because, you know, it was just a few years ago that they finally let China onto the World Trade Organization. So I, I guess I just assumed that there were some, you know, some standards that had to be met before you were admitted, and I guess not. Well, well once again, it's just, if, if you agree to try to work for peace, we'll take you. That's sort of the philosophy. Okay, thanks. Yeah, no, those are great questions. Those are great questions. Uh, well, certainly, and speaking, speaking, sort of going, going right into that, right, Truman talks about these alternative ways of life uh, that compete for converts in the bipolar world, right? And, and, of course, how does he characterize these two ways of life? What, what does he say about each of them? Basically, force versus freedom, right? Sure, force versus freedom, right, talks about on the one hand, free institutions, uh, will of the majority, representative government, free elections, individual liberties, freedom of speech, religion, freedom from political oppression. And then on the other hand, right, will of the minority forced uh, upon the majority, relies on terror and oppression, uh, controlled press and radio, fixed elections, and the suppression of personal freedoms. Um, well, if we look here then, how, how would Truman define containment? What about from this quote below? What's his idea of containment? Assisting free peoples that, that are probably likely to succumb to communism. So, for example, those boundary states that, that were likely to succumb. Yeah, definitely, right? And, and we'll see that help through the years come um, in economic ways, in military ways, as well as in diplomatic ways. Um, well, certainly he talks about um, reasons for U.S.-led containment of communism in the world, you know, uh, and it's interesting because what does he propose to do specifically for Greece and, and Turkey? What, is, what does that end up looking like? What does he ask Congress for? Money and soldiers. Yeah, definitely. So if we look then, and I think it's interesting because, um, and, 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 and you, you can take this in several different ways, this, this relation, but I'm just curious. Um, how would you relate what we've been talking about today to Alma 5210? Once again, there, like I said, there are many angles you could, you could take on this. Uh, here, here's the here's the scripture. It made me it just made me think about what we've been talking about, what um, the the topic is for today. Moroni also sent unto him, desiring him, Tiankum, that he would be faithful in maintaining that quarter of the land, and that he would seek every opportunity to scourge the Lamanites in that quarter, as much as was in his power, that perhaps he might take again by stratagem or some other way those cities which had been taken out of their hands and that he also would fortify and strengthen the cities round about, which had not fallen into the hands of the Lamanites. How would we relate this? Well, this is, of course, a little different since it was all one, you know, the Nephite lands versus the Lamanite lands, but I really like how it seems to explain how containment can be a very righteous thing. Um, in this example, that they were trying to keep the cities that were once, you know, under Nephite hands and free, have been taken over by the Lamanites to to take those back over, but never never once in this in these war chapters did they go into Lamanite lands and try to get rid of the Lamanites completely. It's all about trying to keep the free, religiously free parts free. 
Right. You know, and 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 um, and and you've hit on really sort of two two major interpretations of how this this could relate to what we've been talking about. Certainly, the first is that question of national sovereignty. Right. Where, where does that play in it? And and so you know, going to other countries to do this, does that change things? Um, is it justified? You know, uh, is is it good for the United States to you know help Greece or to help Turkey and that kind of a thing? You know, to help Korea, uh, you know, Vietnam, right? And that's on the one hand. On the other hand, certainly, as you said, right, um, we have the Nephites not going into the Lamanites and you know just taking them over, right? But they're defending themselves in lands that had been taken and ha that had come under Lamanite control, right? Were tried to then um, be brought back, right, into um, Nephite control. And so certainly two different ways you can see it applying there. Um, any other comments? And, yeah, I, I was going to add another difference is that I really trust Moroni as a leader and, and the people working with him. I, I, don't, I don't see him as having ulterior motives or being part of a secret combination, whereas um, with America's policy, you know, I can point out examples of, say, for example, South Africa and many, many African nations where they they pretended to prop up the anti-communist factions for a while and then completely betrayed them and allowed the communists to take over and so mm -hmm. and so their policies aren't consistent and and so there's an element of trust too i mean moroni clearly didn't have ulterior motives of fomenting conflict and other things but i don't mm -hmm. I, it's not a good comparison to today's world yeah definitely right and that and that's another really important factor here to keep in mind Right, that I mean, as much as we can find relations, things that relate, things that connect, right? Certainly, we are talking about apples to oranges, right? Excellent comment. Thank you so much, Wendy. Uh, anything, Heidi, that you want to add, or shall we move on? No, I'm just totally confused, so I'm just listening. Okay. Okay. Are you coming to your tutorial tomorrow? Uh huh. Okay. We'll we'll talk then. Don't worry. We'll catch you okay. up. We'll make sure you I answer all your questions. Okay, well, if we look then, Truman Doctrine, okay, Congress quickly approved both of Truman's requests, 400 million, one, to bolster armed forces in Greece and Turkey, and two, to provide Greece with economic aid. America's intervention eased Soviet pressure on the Straits of Turkey and helped democratic Greece to withstand communist subversion. Encouraged by these successes, Truman would support sweeping containment in the future. And this is interesting to, to note this second part here. The architect of the policy, however, George F. Kennan, would become increasingly critical of using containment to justify intervention in all but the most narrow of vital interests, such as in, and these are um, according to him, such as in nations of direct strategic importance like Japan or the states of Europe, not in nations such as Korea or Vietnam. Kennan disapproved and actually uh, fought against um, U.S policies of containment being enacted in Korea and Vietnam. So it's kind of an interesting, an interesting twist, even though he's the architect uh, of the policy. Well, you can still hear me, right? Yep. Yes. Can you still hear me? Okay. Yep. Yes? Okay. Thank you, George. Okay, well, Truman Doctrine led to increasing military mobilization in the United States, mobilization that would keep America, uh, American armed forces at near wartime levels. In 1948, at Truman's behalf, Congress approved a new military draft and resuscitated the selective service system. When the USSR refused to agree to a proposal of nuclear arms reduction, and this goes back to what Heidi was talking about, thinking, wait, isn't the Cold War about nuclear arms? And yes, it is. Here, here it is, right? Uh, the US increased its atomic research and made nuclear weapons the cornerstone of its defense strategy. The arms race was on. The Atomic Energy Commission, established in 1946, oversaw all American nuclear research. In 1950, Truman encouraged the development of a new hydrogen bomb, a weapon far more powerful than the bombs that had devastated Japan in 1945. In 1947, the National Security Act created the Department of Defense to oversee all branches of the U.S. Armed Forces, the National Security Council to govern foreign and military policy, and the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA, to collect information through both open and covert methods to protect the interests of national security. 1948, Truman cooperated with Britain and France to create a unified pro-West Western Germany from their occupation zones, which also included zones in Western Berlin. Stalin retaliated by blockading the Western sectors of Berlin, hoping that this pressure would force the West to abandon to the East 
its half of the city, which was in the heart of Soviet Eastern Germany. That's because Berlin, uh, the city, right, was located within East, what would become East Germany. So not, not to be confusing. Uh, Truman refused to yield and ordered a massive airlift of supplies to ignore the blockade and bring relief to beleaguered Western Berlin. After 10 months and 2.5 million tons of relief, the Berlin airlift became a success for containment as Stalin lifted the blockade. In 1949, Germany was officially divided into two nations, the pro-West West Germany and the pro-East East Germany. Well, for the sake of time, we'll just skip over this, but you may have heard of the candy bomber. This was actually an LDS serviceman who, during the Berlin airlift, would drop candy um, to uh, the boys and girls um, in, uh, in Berlin and uh, became very famous for it. So, okay, well, creation of NATO. Uh, the Berlin airlift crystallized the de facto alliance of pro-West nations, and in April 1949, 12 nations made their military coalition official with the creation of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO. NATO's members declared that an attack on one would be treated as an attack on all, and that they would keep a standing army in Europe to defend against the threat of Soviet military expansion. In 1955, with the Warsaw Pact, the Soviet Union would form its own Treaty of Military Alliance to counter NATO. Okay, so from the North Atlantic Treaty, um, what principles do NATO's members claim to follow? Well, again, here was another document that quotes heavily from the United Nations Charter and, and is meant to promote peace to people, for people and freedom. Yeah, definitely, right? And, and it's important to note that connection right, between the United Nations um, and these documents. And I appreciate you pointing that out, Wendy. Um, you know, they talk about principles of democracy, individual liberty, rule of law, you know, stability, preservation of peace and security, that sort of thing. Uh, well, and then what would be the purpose? What's the purpose of NATO? The desire to live in peace. Uh, I'm sorry? Uh, I'm sorry, I, could, I couldn't uh, hear you very well. Oh, the desire to live in peace, to safeguard freedoms, to promote stability in the North Atlantic area. Sure, and, and, then, and then of course also, right, to be a military alliance against Soviet expansion. Um, and, so, and so this would become uh, the foremost military alliance to counter um, the threat of, of, of uh, communist, communism spreading throughout the world. Um, we talked about the relationship, right, uh, also, right, so these nations, what do they promise to do then? Uh, and this, this should be eerily familiar, perhaps. Um, <coughs> An um, armed attack against one will be, shall be considered an attack against them all. Right, and, and this, this harkens back to World War I. Um, we think about that. Well, here's the bipolar world. Um, as we can see, right, the dark blue would be the NATO members. Uh, we have the dark red would be um, the counter to NATO, the Warsaw Pact, uh, and its members. Uh, we see the different spheres of influence in, in different shades according to uh, different levels of influence, right? The allies of the USA. Uh, we see anti-communist guerrillas. We see uh, countries allied with the USSR, other allies of the USSR that were non-socialist uh, countries, uh, at least uh, avowedly. Uh, communist guerrillas, as well as then China. We'll talk about China next week and how it's a little bit different, even though it was communist, um, as well as just some non-aligned nations that try, try to play both sides to, uh, to get um, benefits in economic development and um, arms for their own purposes, uh, sort of a thing. Well, then let, let, let's close with this for today then. Um, how does Cold War strategy connect personally to you? Does God give us a policy of appeasement relating to sin and apostasy in the world? Explain. Does God give us a policy of containment relating to sin and apostasy in the world? Explain. Uh, does God give us a policy of rollback relating to sin and apostasy in the world? Explain. Well, I'm thinking of the balance between mercy and justice. Is do you is that kind of what you're looking for? I I maybe. Oh, I'm well, you could you could go in you know in a lot of different ways. But I mean, I guess if you say think about things such as I don't know the attack on the family, 
uh, and the spread of gay marriage. Um, for on one hand, uh, I don't know, then you could think of other sins, such as, I don't know, the spread of, uh, I don't know, smoking and drinking. You know, on the other hand, uh, what about the spread of, of uh, false religious ideas? Um, what do we do about those? Uh, you know, so there, there are many levels to this. Um, so what would you say? Appeasement, would, containment, rollback. I would say there's a lot of containment just with, you know, those who have not, you know, apostatized need to make sure that they remain clean um, and also fighting against the spread of gay marriage and the things that you've mentioned already. I think in, in a very peaceful sense, not in a, an aggressive sense, but our missionary work is a form of rollback where we go out into the world and try to teach people truth so that they can then change if they're, for example, somebody who is very um, sinful or apostate or, or whatever you'd like to say about that. So I'd say that it's a combination of the two from my perspective. Sure. Do we, do, is there ever, is there ever uh, appeasement, do you think? Do you think that there are ever things that happen and we just say, well, hey, they have their agency and, and we let it happen? Or do we take a containment or a rollback stand every time? What would we say? I think the more the more deadly something is, the church takes a stand, uh, but it's still never through force. They just encourage us to to fight for this proposition or whatever. Do they encourage us to vote one way or the other? But but for the most part, the church, because um, maybe that's the direction that you're looking at, the church doesn't doesn't take a position and expects us to bring to pass many good things of our own free will. Mm hmm Yeah. Definitely right. And so and so you know as, as we think about. Um, you know, the world with the many, many choices there, you know, I, I think it, it, it's interesting to just think about different instances when we can see these, these policies at work and, and how, how that would then connect spiritually uh, to us. And certainly, you know, we know from uh, First Nephi 14 that, right, we have uh, the church of the great and abominable church. Um, and it's interesting because um, as, as we look at that, um, how, how can we compare the bipolar world of the Cold War to the bipolar world that we live in today regarding um, truth and untruth? Well, that there are really, uh, in both instances, two drastically different extremes, and that you might think that you're neutral or in the middle, but in reality, you're just moving towards one or the other. Sure, yeah, definitely. And, and you know, it's interesting, I, I, uh, there's this great quote by, by um, Elder McConnell. The carnality, hello? Oh, hello, can you hear me? You yeah, keep, you just uh, keep going hearing. In. What was that? You keep coming in and out. Can you hear me? It's cutting off. We can hear you now. Oh, I'm coming in and out. I see. <sighs> okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, Elder McConkie uh, talked about the church of the devil this way. The church of the devil is the world. It is all the carnality and evil to which fallen man is heir. It is every unholy and wicked practice. It is every false religion. Every supposed system of salvation which does not actually save and exalt man in the highest heaven of the celestial world, it is every church except the true church, whether parading under a Christian or a pagan banner, as Moroni will say in a later era of Nephite history, and as we shall ascertain in our evaluation of uh, revelations, it is secret combinations, oath-bound societies, and the great world force of godless communism. I thought it was very interesting as we relate that. And of course, right, how do we know when uh, we should when we should practice containment or rollback, uh, as the case may be, right? Well, of course, what's the answer? The prophet. Yeah, prophets, both ancient and modern, will, will help us uh, to know uh, what stand we should take in, in this spiritual bipolar world. Um, anyway, thanks so much for the class today. I, I apologize about the technical difficulties. Uh, thanks for putting up with them. I'm not sure what's wrong. I'll talk to Mr. Anderson about it. See, see what the glitches may have may have been. 
I um, noticed anyway, even, even the even the icons are different, so there's some kind of changes going on in the system. Yeah, yeah, there, there, is, there is a change, um, and let's hope it'll be a change for the better. <laughs> so, yeah, really, okay. thank you. Okay, thank you so much. I look forward to the tutorials this week. We've got lots of great things to talk about. Um, and thank you so much for your participation. See you tomorrow, or uh, okay. see, you, see, see you depending on your tutorial, either tomorrow or in the future, uh, and then we'll have class Ow. again on Tuesday. Hi, Mia. How are you? Mia, yeah, what are you doing? What are you doing, sweetie? Your baby's under the bed? Yep. Great. Well, have fun, sweetie. I love you. Bye. I love you, sweetie. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.